Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Reigns, Bibles, and Beyond. Beyond, Beyond. We actually have a special series coming up. And unlike mm-hmm. some of our previous series, we're going to kick one of these out uh, one each week. So you want to you want to mm-hmm. watch the entirety, and there will be five episodes. Mm-hmm. And uh, Joel, why don't you just tell us a little bit about what we're doing here? Well, first, you know, it's important to tell everybody that there's been a big gap here. Um, it yes, was yes, December, uh, like the first, second week of December of 2022, that we even started to record these. And it was uh, several conversations. Yes, and that we're putting all together. We had all these great ideas that we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna have we're gonna have these series of interviews with our friend. Yes, and we're gonna put together this this series of talks. And yeah. well, we had some interviews, and then they got derailed for there for a little oh, bit. Yes, we yeah we both had a lot going on, and then just started snowballing. And uh, but we had these, these great conversations with Brandon Brandon Hendrickson is his name. Yep, but science science is weird. It is, is. is his website. You should check it out. <laughs> Yeah, it's good. It's good stuff. He's a good guy. Uh, we really enjoy having it. It's all about a conversation, not debate style. We actually talk about that. So, you know, in, in the episode here, we're going to introduce Brandon, um, what we're doing, the conversation. We are going to focus on uh, what is known as the fossil record, have a little bit of a niche conversation. We're not going to be debating. Um, and then we're going to begin to discuss what sort of maybe sorting model or mechanisms were there to cause all that we see in what is known as the fossil record. Yeah. So, and and remember, these these were recorded. Well, the first one was recorded December of twenty two. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. And then we we did some in January of twenty three, and then that's when I had some health issues last year. And then when I was yeah. recovered, Joel was kind of kind of out for a while. It was bad. And yeah. then summer hit, which of course is just busy for yes. ministry yes. in general or for life. Mm-hmm. And uh, well. We eventually we eventually had our third a third interview with Brandon. Yes. In June, I think I'm right. I think it was around there. Right. I, don't remember I think exactly. it was June of twenty three, and then then you know the summer hit, and we were trying to get it in before summer, and then we yeah. we did get the interview in, but we didn't get any of the we couldn't do anything any else. editing or anything done. Right. And of course, then it kind of got pushed on the back burner. We've been wanting to get to wanting to get to it. Finally, have sat down, gone through. <laughs> Five six hours of of, oh, of recording. Many hours. Um, cut out all the fluff. Um, but we got basically the the main whole conversation. Right. We really didn't cut out anything pertinent to no, the conversation. No, yeah. uh, just kind of the the some of the extra bantering back and forth between us. Um, getting you know the the prep stuff and then the random like um, pauses right. that we would have for absolutely no reason. So um, <laughs> hey, you're going to get basically the whole, the whole thing in, in, in its entirety, minus the, the stuff that you right. don't want to see. About what, four and a half hours of content they're still going to get? Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's around yeah. there quite it's, a bit over, a over, uh, over like five episodes. Five episodes. Yep. Yep. And plus whatever uh, <laughs> we, we will do a kind of an intro uh, on each of them, just kind of preface what we're going to be discussing right, right. on, on, on each uh, mm-hmm. episode. So anyway, I think, uh, yeah. And wow. we'll, don't miss. There's gonna be a couple of cliffhangers at the end of this episode, so make sure you yeah through. watch the end, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of intro the the next episode here at the end, and you'll see what's coming on next week. Right. But uh, well, before we get into all that though, let's grab our favorite theological drinking receptacles here and um, get started. Let's get started. Let's get started. All right. Hello, everybody. And today we have uh, another special episode we're doing here. And uh, we have our friend Brandon with us. And we're going to be discussing uh, uh, some uh, geology and uh, evolution versus creation. And uh, um, as friends, not enemies, not as uh, an argument, but uh, more of a discussion. And um, just to demonstrate that it's possible for for people to disagree and still have an intelligent conversation and discuss things together and and to be able to point out um, differences in in, in, uh, points of view and and why. So, Brandon, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself and who you are? Sure. I my name is Brandon. I'm the father of two kids with a third possibly having been born by the time that this airs. Uh, uh, I'm a husband. I am the founder of Science is Weird at scienceisweird.com, where the kind of the task, the quest that we have embarked upon is to 
make the world's greatest science curriculum <laughs> one that actually gets at all of not one can never do all but like the deep glories and wonder of the universe nice i like that the grand story right <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah the big that. story he likes the life story. universe and everything and everything so that's one thing that's yeah um, that's so great about science because whether you come from from a uh, creation point of view or an evolution point of view you still have just the facts of science right <laughs> And how we interpret some of the, the evidence will be determined by our, you know, our starting point. But there's still facts that are just the universal to all of us. So um, that's great. So one right. of the things I think that I find most wonderful about the Young Earth Creationist community is that it, it's a community of people who cares about what is true, right? And wants to live yeah. in accordance with what is true. There's like this sort of zeal zeal can go bad right but like there's this kind of joyousness about the young earth community that i think like should be a model for all of us of, of how we interpret science yeah. how we maybe experience science no that that's perfect because thank you for that because because truth matters right um yeah. as somebody who loves science truth should matter yeah. and, and yeah. then fortunately we we do live in a world where uh, a lot of times truth becomes optional and, or we just make it up how we feel and and mm. and that's just not the case in, in real life so it can't be subjective you yeah just, yeah, yeah. I don't you know, there are certain things that are true yeah um yeah. so how we interpret those things there is a difference in those and uh that's the part i guess we want to discuss today so I, I like to remind uh people that you know the word science means knowledge you know mm -hmm. and so uh you know, science is testable observable repeatable mm -hmm. and it's you know it's stuff that you could know you had, you see it, okay, I observe this, I, I can repeat it, it's coming out the same, It's this is true, this is knowledge, you know. And so that's that's something uh, we, we should all be able to adhere to, uh, be objectively true. But yeah, so good. Um, well, Nate, you want to start us off here one way or another? Um, yeah, so uh, today we just want to kind of discuss um, um, what the uh, strat geology, right? geology yeah, yeah. and 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 the the stratus the um, strat stratification stratification yeah. is that the word we're looking for, um, yeah. right? Uh, discussing layers and things. Strategery, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> strategery. So obviously, Brandon, you have uh, uh, points of view on that, and uh, um, maybe, who doesn't? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> we all have a point of view on that. Right, so, right. Brandon, why don't you may just uh, start with um, an intro and explaining why why this is important, especially coming from an evolution's point of view, um, of why this is important, what it means to you and, and your point of view and how it proves what you believe. Yeah. So I will say that insofar as this conversation goes today, I think I'm not interested in specifically having the creationist versus evolutionist debate the way that it's usually done. I'd like to like really focus on one incredibly tiny sort of argument uh, inside of that, which is, I mean, you could call it like young earth creationist versus just old earth, right? <laughs> so in some ways, like the arguments that I'm going to be making, like would be arguments that an old earth creationist would make. But even more specifically <laughs> um, uh, than that, it's the question of whether it may, whether how we explain the things, the rocks that we see around our houses. Okay. And specifically whether that makes sense in a sort of a giant flood, right? A flood geo cataclysmic geomorphology, so are words that are sometimes put here, or whether the rocks around our houses actually show these different chapters in Earth's history. So technically one could actually be a young Earth creationist and still think that the layers show these different chapters, right? And one would just have to say that God created that with like the design to make it look like it was really old and i have some friends who are young earth creationists who believe that so i'm not even specifically going after like young earth creationism here it's just with how we interpret whether the story of the earth is supposed to look like it has just like two chapters like the old world and the new world or whether it's supposed to look like it has like all of these different really weird chapters and i'm put me in camp all these we weird different chapters sure makes sense all right. Well, I, I noticed you you said uh, geomorphology. Uh, just real quick for our viewers' sake, can you describe what you meant uh, when you said that looking at the rocks around your house? 
Yeah. Well, that's great because I'm not really sure that that's a word that I used. So I. Geomorphology. So I, I would think, I mean, I, I think that's what I heard. And just the idea of, you know, rocks are changing. Why do they look the way they do? Right. That's basically. Yeah. And specifically yeah. not even like the rocks themselves. Right. Like I'm not a rock jock. I took geology in college. And very <laughs> cold. Turned very cold by it. Right. Like people who care about like what this kind of silica is versus this kind of silica. Like no interest. I've no that that's fine for those people. Um, but I'm interested in the, like, what kinds of bones, what kinds of animals and plants you find in these different layers. And they tell a story. Um, and I feel like the story that they tell, and like, I don't understand how once we know that story, mm -hmm. um, a young, sorry, not, not a young earth, not that, but like a flood, like a, the idea that all the rocks were formed in a giant, or most of the rocks even were formed in a giant uh, flood, like how that can make sense of what we just very clearly see around our houses. Gotcha. All right. So um, I, I think I'd make a, a just a point of distinction as we go on uh, when we talk about, you know, what we see, does it, was it made to look really old uh, or is it actually old kind of thing? Um, this doesn't, this doesn't actually speak to every conversation, but it, it does speak to some. And the idea of the distinction between maturity and age um, so the idea is like the Bible would teach that, you know, day one of Adam and Eve's existence, they were adults. So they did not have age. They were one day old. Uh, yeah. but their maturity, they're fully mature. So like uh, on that sixth day where the trees have been created, but there's already fruit to pick. Um, there was not age there, but there was maturity. Um, so I would, that does not speak to all the conversations, but that's just one little point of distinction I do like to make sometimes. Sure, sure. Um, yeah. I, I would say yeah. um, if we're looking at um, the rocks around us, uh, I, I think one really neat thing that has to be discussed, and it is discussed on all the sides, but um, we see like ocean fossils uh, mm -hmm. everywhere, even in the, you know, the Northwestern continent here in America uh all over around us and so yeah. you're you're over in minnesota we're over in iowa um as i travel throughout the country people can always take me to spots where there's tons of ocean fossils uh there's ocean fossils on all the mountains uh even uh himalayas on mount everest way up there and um so it seems like uh so correct me but it seems like with uh, an evolutionist or a old earth type uh of view it would be that there was a flood here or a flood there uh, something taking ocean animals up uh, or or splashing here, and then the earth bends up uh, kind of thing. And so I always like to say, it seems like the the whole earth at one time was covered underwater. And uh, it is kind of a tipping my hat to the global flood. Uh, could you speak to that, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think that this is definitely a point in favor of, um, uh, well, let me not say in favor. This, what we see at that one thing that we see is absolutely consistent with a global flood narrative, right? Um, and it has to be that way because almost the only way that there is to make sedimentary rock is to start with muck, right? Like whether it's sand, right? Sand compresses into sandstone, whether it's um, you know, just ooze, you know, clay, you know, Whatever it is, like that's the stuff that ends up getting packed down when enough other things are on top of it for enough time, where all of those little atoms and molecules or whatever get squeezed together, you know, jittered and squeezed together until they're perfectly well fit together. I don't think that the, I'll say that I don't understand how a flood geomorphology perspective can make sense of like how the rocks were actually formed like how they turn from muck into solid rock. But that's a question that if you're interested, we could pursue later because the clearest way in my mind to understand, um, to understand, to see like the story of the earth with your own eyes is to look at the specific kinds of fossils um, that we find in here. Is it okay if I use a visual? Uh, yeah, yeah no, that's fine. Yeah. So um, what we find is these hills, right, where there are all different types of fossils inside of them. Now, 
if all of these fossils were formed from one giant cataclysm where everything is being mixed, there's these giant waves and all of that, then the way that I understand this, and, and please, like I invite you like to, to say, if you think that this is not right, what we should find is that there are, you know, trilobites in all of these things, right? Trilobites, this ancient kind of weird buggy sort of water creature that no longer exists. And you'd find T-Rexes in all of them, and you'd find saber-toothed cats in all of them. Maybe not exactly in all of them perfectly evenly, but if all of the layers are formed at the same time, then you should at least find, you know, some saber-toothed tigers, whatever, in all of them. The thing is, though, we never find that. We never, ever, ever find that. What we always find is something like this, where you find this first chapter, This I, we oftentimes draw it as blue just because that's cool and uniform, this blue layer, I call it the age of ancient sea bugs, <laughs> at the bottom of these hills. Mm -hmm. And this these giant reptiles in the middle and these giant mammals at the top. Now, to be clear, it's really rare to find a T-Rex skull. It's really rare to find a saber-toothed tiger skull, right? Mostly what we're right. finding is um is like little water things, right? Because most fossils, most rock is formed in the water, right? So we only typically find T-Rexes when they fall into the water or something like that happen to be happen to be um uh, buried in mud um before they can be eaten by scavengers right mm -hmm. uh so uh so so it's rare to find these things but when we find these things we never find them in the different layers i i have more to say about this but i'm just curious like this is in some ways like this is like my big argument how how do you guys make sense of this yeah, so um, honestly, there's like an hour of things I want to say, and I, I think you probably feel the same way when you're talking, but um, so I guess um, real quick, I, I think maybe I could start with, because you already alluded to it, uh, how, how fossils are made. Mm -hmm. um, so how, how does it fossilize? Um, well, you know, first off, obviously, you know, if some animal just dies outside right here, um, mm -hmm. it, it most likely it's not going to get fossilized. And why mm -hmm. is that? because of weather, erosion, scavengers, right, things like that. So it has to be covered by the sediment immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, have to be totally covered, be protected from all these things. Um, and what's interesting is we've seen fossils made in a matter of months. Um, it doesn't I don't, take... I, I don't know about that, but I'm, I, I'm interested in that. We can uh, swap some evidence about that later. But, but I'm hearing you say that these things, but I'm not hearing you kind of address, like, why we don't find saber-toothed tiger fossils ever in a different layer. Right, right. Well, I'm lead, I'm leading up there. So it's probably okay, the okay. power thing I'm trying to condense in about yeah, eight minutes here. So, <laughs> so sorry about that. But just, just to, real quick with that, so it'd have to be covered, 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 and that would be a global flood thing where um, it is ripping up whole layers and it's all mud and it is destroying everything and is rapidly covering animals uh, of some kind. Some being totally destroyed, but it, there's something rapidly covered here. Uh, so that would be, I don't think we would disagree about the order of the fossils, really, which is what we're talking about. I think it's more just time. Um, and so to the point of it fossilizing quickly, uh, you have like a, you know, a, a hat, you know, with a, with a building collapsing or something, and it gets fossilized in just a few months. And uh, mm -hmm. a teddy bear uh, being found in a building and stuff like that. Um, so there's definitely things like that. And um, we can bring that up another time, too. Uh, hopefully we'll have a part two uh, to this conversation as well. And so that'd be a lot of fun. Um, so then going right, I guess, let me say this, the Cambrian explosion. Okay. So if I were to look at, um, that graphic that you had, which I should have thought to have some graphics, but <laughs> you're ahead of me here. Um, so if I were to have a cool graphic, you know, that very bottom, that blue layer, um, if, yeah. if it was, you know, you're looking at, um, the whole fossil record, right. Then that would be the Cambrian explosion. And so maybe not everyone knows about that. Uh, so you're looking at roughly 500 million years ago, uh, very specifically, it'd be like the 570 to 530 million years ago, if, if I'm using the millions of years. Um, so covering about 40 million years, you have these, uh, this, all of a sudden there's fossils everywhere. You have plant and animal life. Um, mm -hmm. this is called the, uh, what's the technical word here? The, uh, uh, Phanerozoic period, um, mm -hmm. which is coming from two Greek words and essentially means, Hey, life popped up. <laughs> you know, we, we see there's visible light now. Uh, the, the, the plants and, and animals. 
What's crazy about that is why? Why do you see that? So um, I don't think there is an old earth explanation for that. I think there's some theories, but there's not a, a good explanation. The global flood view would be that uh, as the fountains of the deep broke up, there was the volcanoes, the geysers, the earthquakes, it all started in the oceans, it triggered tsunamis, and so it ripped up the very bottom, and the tsunami pushed it over the land, and so it was the first thing being covered by mud, and that's why we see these things over everywhere at the very bottom. It's all these little buggy creatures uh, that got destroyed first. Um, this would have been given some time for some of the bigger things uh, to try to get to higher ground, higher ground, move around, and uh, where we, a lot of times we see tons of these dinosaurs and things being um, clumped together as they're trying to herd together, run away, get away from whatever's coming, these major catastrophes uh, kind of stuff. And so that's why I would think that that bottom layer would have all those kind of uh, dealios. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the Cambrian explosion, I mean, it's called an explosion for a reason. Uh, it, it's just really quick as far as a, with an evolutionary time scale, very quick. And so, like, if you were to put the whole last, like, 4,500 million years uh, on a football field, then the Cambrian explosion would be between the 12 and 13 yard line. Uh, but it would only cover, like, the first four inches of that yard line. And so very, very, very quick. Um, so you're, you're looking at, you have, like, jellyfish even, uh, whole ecosystems that are there. They're already present. The, the plant and the animal life, totally pleasant. All these ecosystems. You know, how did that get there? How did that develop? There's so many questions. Where's the transitional fossils? Where's the fossils before that? Uh, we do have soft body fossils like raindrops, worms, jellyfish. They've all been fossilized. And so there's no reason like it couldn't be. Um, so, you know, where is all that? So it, it, it Is it okay it, if I interrupt? Because I... Go ahead. Is yeah. it right if I... And you can go back to it if it's not okay. But I guess some of what one of the things that you've said addresses my question, but the other things are sort of separate issues. And I feel like this is something that often happens when um, people try to talk over divides is that we keep jumping between all sorts of different issues and rarely focusing on one. Mm -hmm. um, so is it okay if I sort of help just kind of shepherd us to one of these questions? Sure, go ahead. And, so I'll repeat back what I heard you say about the um, as to an answer to the question, which is that it makes sense that we find like the little buggy creatures at the bottom, because something about the the bottom the, the the wells of the deep being being open. Can you can you state that again? So when the Bible records the worldwide flood, we're looking at Genesis six through eight, and mm -hmm. basically two things happen: the fountains of the deep are opened up, the windows of heaven are opened up, that kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. So what would the fountains of deep be? That would be like the geysers, the earthquakes, the volcanoes mm -hmm. uh, that we would see all over. Um, and so what that would do is that would trigger these massive tsunamis. And then that would be taking up all that stuff from the bottom of the ocean, because that's where all the floods started, really. And it pushes it up over the land. And that's where you have the stuff from the bottom of the ocean being on the bottom layer of the fossil record. Okay, so let me just try to say that. Thank you very much. I've read about this in some Young Earth Creationist books, and I've never really been able to get like a real visual on this, and I feel like I'm getting a, a better visual on this right now. So thank you very much for this. So you're saying that, I, I, I probably should draw this, but let me just use my hands to think <laughs> instead, that if some of the water is upwelling from the bottom, then that's going to push like the bottom feeders up onto the land and then their bodies are going to be on the land and like that's going to be part of the first sort of wave of death and then the other things that die are going to stack on top of them is that is that what i'm hearing um essentially there's yeah other things will be going on top yeah mm -hmm. so in this is, is you're imagining that is it like a they they get swept up and then like they they fossilize into a layer while there's still water above them, be, so they don't like get washed away. So they'd be trapped in mud. It'd be okay. one of the. It'd be so then all the you know when you look at the cliffs, the mountains, you see the layer, layer, layers. Um, we see that as fine sediment being layered down from the yeah. flood, um, not millions of years. And so that would be oh. yeah one some of the first layers uh, that was laid down, trapped in mud, covered by water. If 
if the water is there and it's a giant worldwide flood and it's all sloshing around, I guess I'm having a hard time understanding how that layer of muck and mud would stay there in the in sort of like the multi-chapter model, right? Like it's already turned to rock. So it makes sense that it would stay there and the animals would stay inside of it. But I'm having a hard time understanding why, yeah, why that wouldn't be washed away. Can you so help me? It, it would be completely tossed back and forth, but there's enough. In other words, it's not like there's this little tiny strip of sediments. And mm -hmm. with, with the torrents of water, it would get ripped up again. This would be uh, some major layers, but the water is already increasing incredibly. And so mm -hmm. you, would, you would know that, um, you know, if you're like in a shallow lake, right, um, those are the most dangerous to be in a storm because the energy of the waves from the wind and everything actually hits the bottom and bounces up, right? So it gives you bigger waves. <laughs> But you have like a, an ocean, you know, something very deep anyways, even a deep lake, doesn't have to be an ocean, a deep lake. Um, it's not near as much wave force. So like Lake Erie, for example, Great Lakes over here has more shipwrecks than any other lake in the whole world. And it's because it's a it's a rather shallow lake. Uh, but then like Lake Superior, you know, just right next to it, very deep, hardly a problem. Um, so as the water exponentially has raised already, you wouldn't have that very violent upripping of that already. Does that make that did I say that right? I I think so is I'm hearing you say that. Okay, I, I think I get this. As the water gets deeper, the sloshing gets less, essentially. It won't it won't tear up that bottom again like like it did okay. the first time. Okay, that makes some sense to me. That makes some sense to me. Okay. Awesome. Um, I can provisionally accept that for right now. Thank you. That's really helpful. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, can I ask a different question? Yes, we yeah. do have only a couple minutes left, but yeah. Couple well, here, then let me ask this question, and then if we want to pursue it later, um, uh, we can do it. So, th so Nate, okay. thank, you for that. thank you for that warning. Um, one of the things that I don't show right in this ridiculous Honestly, I, I, I showed it to a, um, a friend of mine who's a fossil collector who's done some stuff in Iowa, actually. Uh, and he was like kind of ticked off. <laughs> and he's like, look, this is just too simple. You can't make it this simple. But no, like once you understand all of like the dang details, right, like then you want more complicated things. But like for those of us who are starting at the bottom of this, we just need simple things. But one of the things that I don't show in this, and actually you kind of sort of um, nodded to before, Joel, is that the most common thing that we find in all of these layers is, you know, we bitsy ocean buggy things, right? We find shells <laughs> in all of these layers. Clam, clam shells, yeah. Friends. Yeah, yeah. Well, what's interesting is that we don't find clam shells, at least like in the rock layer that I live in, the Ordovician. We find these weird clams that are quite different <laughs> um, uh, than any kind of clams that we have alive now i should be able to show some pictures if we're interested in doing this again in the future i can show some pictures of this and i, I mean i actually i actually have some around here um but um we don't but we don't find like that kind of like weird clamshell anywhere like around here <laughs> um we don't find any of like the not the, the standard nowadays clamshells like any time down here um yeah so why like what would be the sorting mechanism whereby one big flood would be able to distinguish from certain like random shapes of clams and put all of them at the top mm. and put all of the other kinds at the bottom. I, you know, I, I would rather hold off and speak on this so I can look at that again. Sure. Uh, to be honest, sure, sure. Yeah. It's, it's just been a, it's been a long time since I visited that. I remember going through that before. Um, but I don't feel confident enough to speak to it right now. <laughs> so if that, that, that's allow perfect. me that privilege. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, that might yeah. have to be part two. We can tease uh, yeah. we tease the audience with that one. I would say, <laughs> since we're another teaser then, mm -hmm. uh, just to give someone to think about the other thing. And we've, we've mentioned this. We didn't actually discuss it yet, but just outside of this, we've mentioned it before. The polystrates, in other words, like the trees going through yeah. all those layers, so if you were to hold that those layers were representative of time each time, then then it it seems to create a problem if there's a tree growing up through many of these layers. 
Um, did you want to speak to that now, or do you want to speak to that another time? Yeah. I mean, so I haven't done very much research into this. I saw a video that you had mentioned that before and got really excited about it because from back in the day when I was a young Earth creationist, I thought that that was like one of the most strong arguments against <laughs> against uh, these layers being laid down at very you know very very different oh. times. And I realized that I'd never gone back and actually had tried to understand like wait like what is like the story on this. Nice. So let's do this. Let's let's actually hold off on this because I don't I feel like I'm not up enough on this. Well, we got cut off right there at the end. So Joel had just asked a question about polystrates, and Brandon um, was saying, "Hey, you know that's a great thing. I want to talk about it. Let's talk about it next time." And uh, right when he was getting ready to tell us that, uh, Courtney got cut off, and uh, we uh, um, we're going to be talking about it next time. So. Um, tune back in for our next episode and uh, with our interview um, discussion with Brandon and uh, we're going to start getting into those polystrates a little bit. We will see you guys next time.